Welcome to episode 37 of Lucretius Today. I'm your host, Cassius, and together with my panelists from the EpicureanFriends.com forum, we'll walk you through the six books of Lucretius's poem and discuss how Epicurean philosophy can apply to you today. Be aware that none of us are professional philosophers, and everyone here is a self-taught Epicurean. We encourage you to study Epicurus for yourself, and we suggest the best place to start is the book Epicurus and His Philosophy by Canadian professor Norman DeWitt. Over the last 36 episodes, we have now gone through all of book one, and this is our last episode for book two. We're going to be discussing today the Latin text that begins around line 1105 until the end of book two. Now let's join the discussion with Charles reading today's text. Besides, after this world was formed and the birthday of the sea, the earth, and the sun was over, there were many particles of matter added to them from without. Many seeds were received every way which the infinite mass of the universe constantly discharged, from whence the sea and the earth grew more strong and vigorous, from when the mansions of the heavens were enlarged and raised their lofty arches higher from the earth, and new air was produced. For from all the parts of the universe the proper seeds are distributed, and retire severally in all places to their proper kinds, the watery to the water, the earth increases by earthy particles, the fiery produce fire, the airy air, till nature, the parent and perfectress of all things, improves all beings to the utmost extent of growth they are capable of. This comes to pass when no more is received into the vital passages than what is perspired and flies off. Then it is that the growth of the creature is at a full stand, and nature restrains it from further increase. For whatever creature you observe to thrive and grow, lively and large, and by degrees climb up to a mature age, receives more particles into itself than it emits, because all the nourishment is easily distributed into the veins, and there confined, and the particles are not so widely scattered as in any proportion to fly off, and so receive a loss faster than they are supplied. For we must allow that many particles certainly fly off from bodies, but many others ought to be coming on, till the thing arrives to its utmost pitch of bulk. Then, by degrees, its strength and maturity of vigor decays, its age melts away and dissolves. For the larger any body is, the greater it is in size when its growth is over. It wastes the more every way and sends out more particles from itself. Nor is the nourishment easily distributed into the veins or nature sufficient to renew and supply those effluvia it throws off in such abundance. In proportion as the defect and the loss require, the animal therefore must necessarily perish when it is made thin by continual perspiration, and all things must at length fall by constant strokes from without. For the supplies from food must fail in old age, nor do bodies from without ever cease to batter and break to pieces all things with strokes not to be resisted. By the same rule, the visible heavens, the surrounding walls of this great world, must tumble down by continual attacks and fall to ruin. It is a nourishment that preserves things in being by constant supplies, but tis all to no purpose, for neither are the veins capable to receive what is sufficient, nor can nature afford a proper and needful recruit. Even now the age of the world is broken, and the earth so feeble and worn out, that it scarce produces a puny kind of creatures, when it bore formerly a lusty race, and brought forth such prodigious bodies of wild beasts. Or, I cannot think all species of creatures descended from the sky by a golden chain upon the earth, nor were there by the sea created, nor by the waves that beat the rocks, but the same earth which now supports them at first gave them being. At first she kindly, of her own accord, raised the rich fruits and delightful vines for the benefit of men. She freely of herself offered her sweet produce, the corn and tender grass, which now scare rise to perfection with all our labor. We wear out our oxen and the strength of our husbandmen. We can scarce find plowshares sufficient to till the fields. Things are so averse to grow, and our labors are forever increasing. And now the lusty plowman shakes his head and laments the pains he took was oft in vain. And when he compares the present times with the glorious days that are past, he blesses the good fortune of those that were before him. He talks loudly how the old race of men, filled with piety, no doubt spent their happy days within the narrow bounds of their own field. 
for then every man's share of ground was much less than it is now, but has no notion, fond fool, that things by degrees decay and worn out by old age hasten to ruin to the utmost period of their duration. Thank you for reading that, Charles. We've now reached the end of book two and appreciate the efforts that everybody has put into getting us this far. So we come to basically the point today that everything in the universe comes together and eventually pulls apart over time. But there's a lot of interesting stuff in these paragraphs today, I think. I noticed another callback to uh, Anaxagoras. <laughs> when I was first reading this, I thought that those stood out pretty uh, far from the rest of the text because normally this is really linked in with a lot of poetic imagery. And I think that's where this kind of came in because otherwise he'd be talking about the seeds and the, the elementary particles rather than the earthy particles attaching themselves to the earth or the fiery particles producing fire. Yeah, he's talking definitely at a higher level there than the elemental particles because he's basically been saying that the earth is not made of earth particles and so forth. So he's, you have to take into account what he's previously said mm -hmm. in, in the words here because it's kind of, like you say, it's kind of poetic. It's not as precise as what he's been saying before when he talks about earthy particles because he's basically been saying that earthy particles don't exist. Particles are particles come together to form yeah. earthy co combinations. And he immediately says before the proper seeds are distributed, but even still you would need the context beforehand. I mean, this is a conclusion of book two, so it makes sense. Right. I wonder if it's of interest or he was really meaning to distinguish in, in the very first sentence we read today, he says, after the world was formed, there were many particles of matter added to them from without. And then he goes on to explain the rest of it. So I wonder if that means anything. He's certainly saying that, they, that it was not made at a single moment in full effect. Mm. Now he, he draws a correct conclusion. So once uh, ob big objects like the Earth and the Sun are formed, then uh, b because uh, the universe is full of particles flying around, of course, new particles will just hit and grow more. And this is what we actually observe. So th the Earth is growing. I forgot the number, but it's something like a centimeter per year or something like this in size or at least some millimeters. No? Uh, so uh, per year from, from space dust. No? That's fascinating. I've never heard that before. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't heard that either. And for, did, I mean, this is uh, this is uh, you can see this you can roughly estimate it from uh, how deep under the earth the uh, remains of the ancient Romans are in Cologne. So uh, they are from about two thousand years ago, and they are two meter deep. So that would means roughly roughly it's one millimeter uh, per uh, per year which accumulates. And of course, you cannot really st separate everything there out. So you will also have dust from the mountainous area or from the desert or something. But also you have it from from space. Okay, Martin, I'm not going to go off too far on a tangent, but you've raised something that I've always found interesting, the issue of how these remains seem to sink down into the earth. You just referenced Roman remains in Cologne. Can you mm -hmm. elaborate on that? When I attended a guided tour, then the, the tour guide gave this explanation that uh, they are two meter underground because... Uh, uh, he referred just to space dust, but I think it's dust from everywhere which uh, will fill up the ground. Well, I presume that it was things like riverbanks, rivers flowing and depositing new dirt over areas that had been settled before. I presume things, and I guess, you know, the, how the rivers bring down particles from the mountainsides, and uh, I presume that those were the main mechanisms, but you think that there's actually other, it's not just a matter of redistributing the particles here on Earth, it's, it's, it's additional particles coming from outside. Yes, and the other thing is that uh, we can see this also in Cologne, because the area around the cathedral, that is actually a rock. And that is way above the river. Even when there is a, a flood, and in the past, the floods were not as severe as today because the river was spread out across about 10 kilometer width in that area. And now it's confined to 400 meters. So that means this rock was always above the level. So that means there's no way that uh, uh, sand from the water would uh, be uh, uh, cover uh, what is uh, built on that rock. Uh -huh. and, and, and nowadays, we may not observe this, this effect so clearly anymore because we do this very daily street cleaning. Né? So any dust will be washed away. Uh, so, But in the past, it didn't have that. So so, so dust would accumulate. Né? 
So, so the roads were not sealed. They, they were made of rocks, and in between, uh, things could sink in. Also, this is what eventually uh, led, this mechanism led the sun turn into a sun. No? So it started off as an agglomeration of mass, and by collecting more and more, it eventually became critical enough that we would have this collapse, which would trigger the fusion. And another thing is that one of the reasons it's speculated that we, we have life existing on Earth is because we have a very huge other planet, Jupiter, not far from us, which would collect a lot of these larger debris from the asteroid belt, uh, because uh, a lot more of those would uh, otherwise fall onto Earth and maybe wreak havoc, the, the larger ones and make it more difficult for life to at least develop further. No? So, so, so there's a multiple things where this uh, plays in. And it's quite interesting because it's a fairly logical consequence of the way, in, in principle, uh, if you was figured the universe being built from, from particles like that, it's an immediate consequence. And in this, in this aspect, he's right. I mean, later on, he writes something what's nonsense, but from, from this aspect, he's exactly spot on which is quite uh-huh. remarkable. Very interesting. We can go on to the second paragraph then here of the four that we have today, which is basically, a, I suppose, a, an elaboration or a restatement of the mechanism by which he's uh, observed the Earth increases in the first paragraph. Yeah, he just applies it on a much smaller scale. At first he was talking about the Earth, and now he's talking about individual creatures, it looks like. Mm-hmm. But he's making the same general proposition. Yeah, and it, again, yeah. it's it's largely correct. So, for example, one idea is that the reason we have so much water on Earth, this was all carried in by comets and meteorites, because the original composition of Earth would not have that much water, or it would have but evaporated. I've not heard that either. That's another interesting thing to me. I'm very familiar. You know, you, you see pictures of the moon, and, and you see all these... Um, science fiction or, or just any any kind of science literature is going to have pictures of meteorites crashing into the moon or into Mars or into Venus or whatever, and, and presumably into Earth as well. Of course, if the atmos- if they burn up in the atmosphere, that doesn't mean that their particles are going to nothing. Their particles are still going to be part of the Earth after that, I guess. Mm-hmm. So, so you definitely would have the Earth increasing in size. Are you saying that they so, – so there's not a way to measure that, Martin uh, – Except maybe locally, or is there some kind of a is, is there some kind of a scientific calculation now as to the mass of the Earth that, that actually is increasing? You know, the, the, certainly the, this data exists because they can estimate what is the average annual intake for meteorites and similar bodies and from space dust, and uh, that one uh, should add up to something like in the order of one millimeter per per year. Uh huh. Interesting. Interesting. Well, if we go to the third section we have here where he starts talking about by the same rule, the heavens and the walls of the world must tumble down by continual attacks and fall to ruin. Yeah, and there, um, there, he, there he gets wrong because he draws a wrong analogy because he doesn't have the right model uh, except for the basic, basic one. And then he draws the wrong conclusion. Well, okay. Why do you say that? Because if the meteorites are going to continue to uh, hit the Earth for an infinity of time, uh, what, what is eventually going to happen to the Earth that would be different from what he's implying here? I mean, because this impact of the meteorites doesn't damage the Earth. It's, it just gets redistributed, and eventually sediments will form new rocks. So uh, uh, that means uh, there nothing happens. I mean, because Earth is small, it would take too many billion years that Earth could become into a sun. So then we have the overarching scenario that the sun will just grow to consume the Earth. So it will approximately reach the, the Earth's uh, uh, trajectory. And uh, so, so even if it doesn't reach it completely, it will, the sun will still be so hot that all life on Earth will be erased. So, so, so this is what uh, what's going to happen. And uh, we, uh, I, I didn't see an exact prediction whether it would we would then fall, Earth would fall into the sun or still circulate close to the sun around it. Okay, so just to be precise on what you're saying, so that is the latest predictions of science as to the ultimate fate of the Earth is that the, the sun will itself expand or or get hotter to the point where life is not sustainable on Earth. I mean, actually, it will be cooler, but it will still be hot for life. So it will just grow. Uh, because uh, mm-hmm. the turns into a red giant and expands. Yeah, 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 yes, exactly. And and the the calculated expansion will be a, approximately close to the 
size of the trajectory of the Earth. And, and of course, they are, they are even much longer. I mean, this is what, what happens in something like, I don't remember the exam, exact number, but it's something like five to 10 billion years, billion years. So in the area, uh, in, on the time frame of some several billion years, that's what happens. And then there's, of course, a much larger picture what happens even in the far more distant future. So in this case, his analogy ends up being not what we would predict because his analogy is ultimately that everything that gathers together particles eventually is going to lose them at a at a ever increasing rate to the point where where it cannot sustain itself further. So so we're not thinking that the Earth ends up losing particles over time. Something else is going to happen before that could actually occur. The Earth is going to be overwhelmed by the sun first. Yeah, yeah. And and the other thing is that for the Earth, it's a balance. Earth is losing all the particles, but it it wins more than it loses. So it loses predominantly hydrogen, and it gains uh, than anything was heavier than hydrogen. Yeah, let's talk about that for a second. To the extent you know about it, to what extent does the Earth lose particles? Yeah, it loses hydrogen. Okay, just out of the atmosphere, it it, the, it escapes the the, the gravitational yes, yes. pull. Because this is the one what prevent preferentially will, uh, because it has the longest tail into space and then eventually will get lost. Does it lose anything else at a slower rate than hydrogen? I mean, a anything else should be replenished because mm. rocks can contain oxide probably. So if we lose a bit of oxygen, that oxygen will be uh, in principle be replaced. No, with, with nitrogen, okay. I'm sure. Uh, with nitrogen, I'm not sure. But uh, the only thing I read is that we are losing, that, that there's a net loss of hydrogen. Now, it occurs to me, and this is an area where you put, where putting too much stress on a particular word is probably a bad idea. But I, in the, in the beginning of this sentence that I'm reading right now, says, by the same rule, the visible heavens, the surrounding walls of this great world. When he uses the word world, that takes us back to the issue that I think Epicurus defined world in a way as to include more than just the Earth. He was talking about a particular local star system or something like that, some commentary say now, I don't know what the right answer to that is and whether he intended whether he intends earth here because he says earth you know again I don't know what he said we're relying on these translators and we're we don't we're not looking at the original Latin to know uh, exactly which he's saying but one thing to keep in mind in studying Epicurus is apparently like in the letter to Herodotus Epicurus talks about a world as being a combination of things like the sun and planets and stars and not just a single body. Martin, have you picked yeah, yeah. that up anywhere? Do you have a comment uh, on that? Uh, yes, I mean, that, that one, to me, it looks like that's quite a consensus. So it's basically something like uh, on the scale between a planetary system or the solar system or a galaxy in, on, in mm -hmm. that size, no? but not bigger than a galaxy. The thing is that uh, probably he was not aware of uh, what is the uh, what, what is actually a solar system and what is a galaxy because uh, people just couldn't see that accurately. So in, uh, if they had, had the right model, they could, in, could interpret the Milky Way as an arm or, or two arms of the galaxy. And uh, but, but, but for this one, you need to have already a more intrinsic model. So it's not obvious to come from, the, from seeing the Milky Way to the conclusion that this is the extent of the galaxy of we are a part of. Now, Charles, you may have read more into this than I have, but this is definitely beyond the extent of my of my research into Epicurus. I, I know there are people who have written a pretty good bit about what Epicurus meant by worlds and how they come into being and, and swirls. And if either of you guys uh, know anything about that, you want to throw in here, please do. I'm probably not going to go much further with that because I know I don't know the, the detail. No, only that in the letter to Herodotus, there's um, there's he also talked a bit about hard bodies, but I can't think of anything else to add. General yeah. consensus along the translations um, is to use the word world, uh, which yeah. just brings us back to our first point about emphasis on the translations and yeah my expectation of what he's talking about is that he's he's starting at this picture of the universe being just floating elements among void and he has to pick a a, a location or a locale where they start to form a, a, a universe or bodies and so however he sees 
this locale of, of where these atoms start to come together is what he's talking about with the world. And that's not necessarily the Earth. It's not necessarily a solar system or not necessarily a, a galaxy. It's, it's what he's seeing as the, the organizing area, whatever that is. With that portion, he was right. I mean, he couldn't predict exactly these objects we now identify, but uh, the principal idea is correct because once you have an agglomeration of something there, this agglomeration will grow typically. I mean, there's one mechanism. If uh, there's one uh, body orbiting another one, uh, the, 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 it could be that it's uh, at some point taken apart. That, that, that may happen. And the, the criterion for this one is if the uh, difference between centrifugal force and gravitational force uh, across the diameter of this one is be, uh, is is too big, then it uh, bigger than the forces holding the matter together, then it may take them apart. And we can we see objects which uh, happen which happen like that. The rings of Saturn are thought to be formed like that. So there there, there were originally moons around Saturn, and those get, got then uh, yeah torn apart. But but mm. other than that. Uh, t- typically, uh, any agglomerated object will grow under the conditions where we fly through uh, space, where we collect space dust, and where meteorites will hit. And the bigger mm-hmm. an object is, the more likely it is, of course, to collect more. And uh, okay. go- going further, so, so where another thing where he goes uh, completely wrong is that uh, the, he, he concludes from veins in living beings that the Earth will have veins too. That's nonsense. So the 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 the, the, way, the Earth doesn't need veins to that the, the particles coming in from which the Earth grows uh, need to be distributed. And also, it's quite interesting. So I think what he, uh, uh, he, uh, that Lucretius, I think it's not from Epicurus, but it's from Lucretius, because in in ancient Rome they probably still knew how it was there before they overexploited their environment. Uh, I mean, the, it thought that the Mediterranean was full with lush forest. And at the time of the Romans, it was turned into this almost desert-like, where only these dry bushes are still there. There are very few forests left. And they probably also did with the increase in population over hunting. So, and he draws the wrong conclusion that uh, Earth has become feeble because it does not produce that much anymore. But instead, mm-hmm. these were the visible signs of an ecological catastrophe that the ancient Romans had wiped out uh, most of the game population and had destroyed their habitats. That's a good point, Martin. Now, when you talk about where he says the earth is feeble and worn out, in, in the passage I'm looking at, he continues that sentence by saying that it scarce produces a puny kind of creatures where it formerly where it bore formerly a lusty race. So they have chopped down all the trees and caused a, cl- a climate catastrophe, as you said. Yeah, I climate not yet. For, for climate, it is too small scale. But uh, mm-hmm. an ecologic local catastrophe without the forest, you you don't normally get enough water. And uh, also, if you cut it down drastically, you can also not easily grow new forests. Well, you know, I, I was about to say that I, I thought he was I think he was making a different point. But I guess you could say also that because those forests aren't there anymore, the animals aren't going to be able to grow or develop in size even because he's really he's really yes. focusing on the puny creatures is the only thing that the earth produces anymore but whether he's talking about the area of italy or whether he's talking about the world in general certainly if you cut back all the forests and you destroy the local ecology then you're not going to be having much development of animals in, in that t- environment and, and, and certainly with their arms they could already do uh, overhunting no? so so that was mm-hmm. us as the other uh, contributor so so those wild animals were squeezed from both sides no? loss mm-hmm. of habitat and overhunting but as he continues that paragraph that we're looking at, he, he does go further and talk about that he doesn't think that life descended from the sky on a golden chain. He, and he's really kind of making the assertion that animals developed from the earth as opposed to from the sea or from the air or from the rocks or whatever, uh, which is probably a, a questionable conclusion. But I don't know. Maybe it's maybe it's still the most logical one. That, I have this picture in my mind of fish crawling out of the ocean to come to the ground and becoming land animals and so forth from grammar school. But Martin, what do you think about where animals develop? They develop on the, is it reasonable to say they developed on on the earth as opposed to the sea? Yeah, I mean, at first, I mean, it depends. I think English has a funny 
uh, usage of animals. No? So basically, fish would also be animals, and they develop yeah, all, yes. obviously in the water. No? So and uh, uh, and then we have of course the land animals proper, which then once they had started to evolve, then eventually when uh, uh, the amphibians uh, they were still on bo in both areas. No? But the reptiles eventually, uh, depending on what species could completely become independent of living in the water. They could entirely live on land. Right? And then the birds and, and mammals, and anyway, typically, uh, except for for those uh, mammals, which again re went back to the sea. Right? So, uh, the, so, so, so that is a mixed thing. Right? So the origin is certainly in the water and probably, most probably in that area uh, uh, at the coast no? between uh, water and land, you know, so where puddles would form, which uh, with uh, rising and falling levels, you know, and these are considered the most likely places where life could uh, develop and uh, further advance, you know. and then of right. course spread spread from there further uh, deeper into the water and to little the land. You know. So, but but the idea that it springs from Earth is somehow wrong. So the so it somehow can be applied to plant because the nutrients uh, which are dissolved by water and taken up by the root of the plant, that one with, with a bit of a stretch, we can still say that's from earth. And then uh, for the animals, we need them to add the animals eat plants and in this way they get nourished by earth. But in other ways, they, are, they don't typically do not uh, live off earth in that sense. No? They live off the plants. So, so that one is uh, then uh, there he's, uh, that is a thing that uh, he's still in this wrong concept about what we would call elements and uh, in, in that one he's trapped and that leads then easily to the wrong conclusions. Well, we have now reached the point where we're about to look at the last paragraph of book two. And I think we're going to see that this last paragraph, it looks to me like it really turns philosophical or poetic. And he's really detaching himself in this last paragraph from a very specific observation about elements or about animals or about the formation of the world or anything like that. So why don't we look at the last paragraph and begin to get our thoughts together on where we would end book two. Let me read the Martin Ferguson Smith edition as the final way we close out book two. This is what Martin Ferguson Smith has as his, as his last paragraph. He divides it a little bit differently. Moreover, in the beginning, the earth herself spontaneously produced lustrous crops and exuberant vines for mortals. She herself gave them pleasant fruits and lush pastures, which now scarcely grow in spite of our toilsome tendance. We exhaust our oxen, sap the strength of our farmers, and wear out our iron implements and fields that scarcely afford subsistence. So ungenerous is their yield, and so surely do they demand increasing toil. Now the aged plowman shakes his head, and time after time sighs that his hard labor has all come to nothing. And when he compares present times with times past, he often extols his father's fortune. His gloomy sentiments are echoed by the planter of the old shriveled vine who deplores the tendency of the times, heaps abuse upon the age, and growls that the people of olden days, paragons of piety, supported life comfortably on their narrow plots, even though the portion of land owned by each man was formerly much smaller than now. Only he fails to grasp that all things gradually decay and head for the reef of destruction, exhausted by long lapse of time. So in what way is that a appropriate conclusion to book two? I'd have to reread the introduction to book three. <laughs> well, one thing I would say is that it's a reminder that life comes to an end for everything, including us, and that we have to be very careful to make hay while the sun shines, because nothing is going to survive forever. It's a good time to talk about the mortality of the soul. And that's what we're going to turn to, I guess, mm -hmm. very soon, isn't it? Yep. Yes. For some reason, reading that reminds me of a phrase that I hear is attributed to Cicero, that, that one of his 
famous statements was, oh, the times, oh, the morals or something like that when he was decrying how Rome had decayed. But I just kind of see in this last paragraph, he's evoking how common it is for all of us as we get older to lament how times seem to be not nearly as as successful and as lively and happy as they were. And that that's just something that's part of the cycle of the universe. Yeah, but again, we need to keep in mind his energy here is wrong. So... I think it's again a hint at the ecological catastrophe, so that they, the Romans apparently did not figure out that they need to replenish the, the, some of the minerals which are used up by agriculture. So, and it clearly indicates that they had a problem with yields in the Roman Empire at the time of Lucretius already. And, and this, this tells me that they did not yet know how to do that. Yeah. So that yeah. means they were still at the level of the, the primitive, more primitive older cultures in, in the forest, where they would uh, just slash a part of the forest, grow for a couple of years, and once uh, the uh, minerals were, the, the readily available minerals in that area were lost by, uh, were consumed by the plants which had then eaten and disposed of elsewhere, then they, they could no more efficiently grow, they had to move elsewhere. And on a slower scale, but uh, if we take this uh, by its word, then this happened uh, in, in, in the Roman Empire too, and, the, and, the, and that make, make, makes somehow sense, no? if they did, didn't figure it out yet how to, how to do that properly. And, and, and that means it's not that uh, this turns old, it's just that the agriculture was done wrongly. Well, there's always multiple levels of things that we talk about. And as in, a, in an individual local level, based on my reading, you're very much correct about how the Romans had misused their local area and caused these problems for themselves. And so it looks like Lucretius was looking at that local analogy and using it as an example of his philosophical point, because his philosophical point is much wider than just applying it to the local Roman environment or the local Roman environs of, of his time. He's, he's making the general philosophical point, or at least he's asserting the general philosophical point that all things that come together eventually come apart. Uh, yeah, but here's, global... there's, there's one thing what doesn't have to be like that, and he's uh, running into a stoic trap here, because he thinks nothing can be done about the falling years. Of course, but, but if you have the wrong models, of course, nothing can be done. And then you, you are like a stoic there. You can't do anything about it. But if you have the right model, mm -hmm. you know, ah, you need to make sure that the minerals get replenished. And then you have your yields up again. Huh? Right. Now, Martin, you're continuing to focus on the local environmental issues. And I think you're right to be doing that. But I, I thought when you said there's one thing that doesn't fall for that theory, I thought you were going to say, the Epicurean gods, because in, in the Epicurean theory, the gods have perfected the method of replenishing their elements. I think that's the distinguishing factor of, of them and their, their ultimate effective immortality is that they replenish their own atoms and, and they are able to do that continuously, which would be in contrast to any local individual, including the earth itself, uh, from, the, from the widest point of view, that unless you're able to maintain your atomic structure consistently over time, then you are ultimately bound for destruction. And logically, the only thing that in Epicurean terms is able to do that is, is something that has mastered that art of replenishing its atoms, which is the Epicurean gods, according to On the Nature of the Gods, uh, Valais, and, and that record that we have from Cicero. But I know that's not the point you were making. I know the point you're making locally is absolutely, you don't be a stoic, you don't just accept things as they are, if you can change them, you go out and change them. You prolong your life, you live your life as successfully and as long as you possibly can by intelligent use of resources and by not destroying the environment around you and doing things that make life come to an end sooner than it otherwise has to. Yeah, the other thing is we need to really see here where he's wrong is that uh, the observation from living beings what we see there cannot be just 
uh, transferred by analogy to non-living things. Ne? So the mechanism by which a planet would eventually modify an, uh, also find an end is entirely different. Ne? So there we don't have this that it's uh, a planet is losing particles more than he gains. So so this is something a simplified models how uh, our, uh, how one of the phenomen phenomena is like when a living beings with a final lifetime uh, dies. Ne? Uh, and, but this doesn't apply to rocks or something like that. No? So, uh, so, so that, that, that are then more like catastrophic events from outside, which uh, lead to their destruction. No? And uh, that is different from living beings. Yeah, that's the, the old issue of when, when you use an analogy, you've got to be very careful that the things you're comparing are of the same nature and have all the same circumstances around them. And it's very difficult to make sure you've accounted for all of the circumstances being the same. The Earth versus a cat have very different circumstances of means of survival and growth and death. Charles, your input is needed. Uh, I mean, I agree because when Lucretius makes the analogy between Earth and creatures, he assumes that the Earth or worlds or p potentially other worlds have veins, and that's not true <laughs> but figuratively speaking if you were defending his position you would take the position that he's being very figurative there and that mm -hmm. all he's when, when he's talking about a vein in an animal he's really just talking about that each entity has its own mechanism he's just talking about yes. what the mechanism is mm -hmm. some way for the particles to make their way on the earth yeah, because I do think the direction he's going in is to he's setting the stage to acclimate everybody because he's his, a lot of his attention is always focused on just how we live our lives and how we see ourselves in the universe. I think it's he's probably one of the things he's probably doing is acclimating people to understand that they themselves come to an end and die just like everything else in the universe does, just like the, the world itself is not permanent. Nothing is permanent. It's probably a means of, of reconciling yourself to the fact that you're not permanent, too. We're about to come to an end to book two here, so we probably ought to think about just general commentary to include book two with before we launch next week or as soon as we can into book three. That's usually tradition for Martin to go first. Maybe traditions come to pass as well. <laughs> traditions come to an end as well. Yes, yes. No, I think it's a good tradition because normally if Elaine Simes says something, there's nothing left for me to say in addition. So <laughs> We need to use a second to just fall back to just a general overview of book two and what we've been discussing here as opposed to book one. Is there a way to summarize what we've done in book two that's different than book one? Uh, kind of. It's a lot more in depth. He's, he's certainly gone into much more detail about the nature of the atoms, and he's, in book one, basically set up the, the system that the universe operates naturally based on atoms and void, and here in book two, he has just done a, a lot more detail about how that actually occurs with the atoms and void. But are there are there overarching conclusions that you can say he's drawing from from what we've seen in book two? I mean, here at the end, I, I do think for, for better or for worse, he's he's making the ultimate point that everything comes to an end. Everything that comes together comes to an end, which is a, sort of an extension of everything comes from something and nothing goes to nothing. It's kind of a of, of an addition to that. And he's just spent a lot of time in book two hammering how all this can happen without the direction of supernatural beings. Because mm -hmm. there's been some mention of the gods here and there that we've been able to sort of like look through the text and know that's what he's alluding towards. Right. You know, I'm looking at Monroe's summary and there's a lot of discussion in this section in book two about color. And I think that's a reminder of where he's hammering home the point that the elements themselves do not have color or other qualities as a permanent attribute of them, which DeWitt would say goes to combat the platonic idea that there are eternal ideas or that anything is eternal other than the atoms themselves. Because you've got to have something eternal other than the atoms in order to erect a, a platonic theistic universe of, of some realm of permanent forms and the uh, the atoms having qualities like that it 
I mean, it doesn't make sense in comparison to them sort of being a building block to be distributed to everything else or comprising everything else, uh, because then they would inherit those qualities. Uh, something that was talked about at like the end of book one and then again towards the beginning of book two. And if they have inherent qualities, they sort of, the, yes, they do become a bit more platonic, like the uh, platonic solids or something. Right. You know, right this second, if I were forced to give a sentence or make a single point that is what book two seems to be all about, that would probably be near the top of my list, that he is asserting that the ultimate elements of the universe are not made that people are not made of little people that trees are not made of little trees that the atoms themselves do not have any of the qualities um, that we see around us but they are used to form all of the things that we see around us and not supernatural intervention that everything we see around us comes from the natural interaction of atoms and void and not from a supernatural intervention. And so book two has largely been explaining how that's the case. Martin, you want to say anything in summary about book two? Yeah, I still don't have the right idea of what, what to say. Hmm. Okay. I'm glad we've got it completed because this book was challenging. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I know that what we've been doing over the last several, uh, as we've gone through book two, we've been talking a lot about these spe the specifics of his observations about atoms and void, and sometimes he's right and sometimes he's wrong. And so we have to be very careful about getting so bogged down in the trees that we don't see the forest. And the forest is the ultimate conclusions about how this does operate naturally without supernatural intervention. Even if he's got certain details of it incorrect, he's still come up with a, a reasonable theory about how things work without control of the gods. And so in book three, it looks like to me he's he's turning to the issue of, of the soul and spirit and consciousness and things like that that will be much more interesting to us. But I, I do think that this is an area that people stumble over is if I'm going to repeat myself, but if you get just too caught up into the detail of what the atom is about, you lose sight of the issue that the the whole purpose of discussing atoms is to show how this happens naturally. Mm -hmm. And as long as it happens naturally, then it really doesn't matter that much about whether a particular item that he's got is totally on base or somewhat off base. And that's why... And that's part of the distinctions between Democritus and Epicurus, is that Epicurus wasn't a scientist for the sake of science. That is exactly the point I was about to make, Charles. We are not studying this because we are attempting to become the best scientists that ever lived. And that was the same with Epicurus and the people he was talking to, is that wisdom is not an end in itself. Science is not an end in itself. At the end of the hour, at the end of the day, at the end of our discussion, we have to go out and live our lives. And we have to decide how we're going to spend our time and what we're going to pursue. And we're never going to have all of the information about science that we would like to have. We have a lot more than they did in Epicurus's time, but we still don't have all the answers about any of the stuff ourselves. We know a lot more, but not, not a complete amount. And so that doesn't mean that we can just absolve ourselves of all decision making. We just can't be a total skeptic and say, I don't know these things. And so therefore, there's no way for me to know what to do. I'm just going to stay in bed this morning. You've got to get out of bed. You've got to live your life as best you can do it. And the idea that there is a reasonable system that explains how the world operates without supernatural gods is a very useful thing for people who actually have to live their lives as opposed to just sit in a classroom and debate it eternally. Nobody has that luxury of being in a classroom for an eternity discussing possibilities. They have to ultimately make decisions about life based on what they think is the most likely uh, answer to basic questions. Now I'm pontificating too much, but nevertheless, that's the way I see the significance of a lot of this in book two. Okay, we can begin to come to a conclusion for today. Any final thoughts from anybody? Nothing that's already been said. Martin? Yes, you put it pretty much on spot so that uh, it exemplifies how uh, a natural uh, uh, explanation of phenomena works out. 
and it doesn't matter whether, whether a lot of things are now wrong from the better models we have now or not, because uh, it, it's helpful enough that uh, it can be demonstrated that things can be explained naturally without reference to the supernatural. Which ultimately is one of the biggest challenges we all face is that out in the world around us, the supernatural is constantly thrust at us as what we should be following and what we should be listening to and what we should be living our lives according to. And so even though it takes a lot of effort to work your way through it, there's a certain number of people who need that foundation, who want that foundation to give them confidence in, in resisting these supernatural arguments. And I've not come across myself anything more persuasive about the way to look at the world than, than this. Well, I guess there's another thing, too, in that sort of the purpose or what's been kept in mind the whole time that we can't forget is that um, even though there's all these explanations about natural phenomena, it's still all within the mind or goal that pleasure is the end. Right. And that ties in very heavily to, you know, not doing science for the sake of science. It's the explanation and justification for pleasure. That's right. That's right. Because if there is a supernatural God, if we can dig deep enough into an atom and find an ideal form, then we need to listen to those things and follow them. But as we drill down and observe and investigate as best we possibly can, we just don't find the evidence of that. And so we, what we do is find is, is that uh, nature gave us certain faculties to live by, and among those are pleasure and pain, and those are the ultimate indicia of choice, not a direction now, even from if a you God. Find it, Go even ahead. If you find an idea form even if you find an idea form that is no reason to worship it so uh, mm -hmm. it, it will not change things dramatically because some people really take this reductionism uh, consequently they, they point this out that because of the, uh, the the universe can be modeled mathematically mathematics is essentially something like the ideal idea form of our world yes that's an example I mean you certainly can it, it is it is awesome how formulas and, and mathematics and geometry and words can be used to, to explain things. It, it can become very, very enticing to look at the complexity of something that we can erect and say that we've therefore explained it and that we've therefore found something that is the ultimate thing that we should worship in the words that you used, Mark. But that's not the case. Yeah, I mean, exactly what you say. There's no point. There's no reason to worship that. There's nothing godlike about an idea form in, uh, in that way. No? And ultimately, that gets back to the question of ultimately, what is the reason that we do anything? What is the reason that we exert our effort in any direction other than for the reward of of feeling, other than feeling itself? If we don't have feeling, we don't exist. We're like a rock. And, and of course, rocks exist, so I, maybe I shouldn't say we don't exist. Yeah, we don't exist as living beings. Hmm? I mean, just being there like a rock is no point. It's like when Epicurus said that without sensation is nothing to us. Of course, that was in the context of like living beings, but yeah. Okay, as we close today's book, too, I want to thank you guys for all of your reliability and the effort that you've put into going through the two books so far. I know Elaine could not be with us today, but she's been an incredibly valuable part of this as well, and she'll be back next week, as I understand it. So with that, we'll close for today and be talking with you again soon. So thanks very much, guys. Bye. Thanks, everybody.